tell me about the infinite game yeah. and what, what are the issues that you had that led to the wisdom in the infinite game? So I'm an idealist, mm -hmm. um, I'm an optimist, and, um, and the problem is I live in a world, we all live in a world, in which the overwhelming pressures are on us to make the numbers, mm -hmm. hit the target, you know, whatever, whatever it is, it's all very, all very finite. And, and I, it feels wrong to me, but I can't tell you why. You know, I just doesn't, like, why can I, how can I tell that person that that's wrong, that there's another way of seeing the world when that's the way the world works? You know, almost all business is based on quarterly annual results. Yeah, you know, we hit targets. We, 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 w most people are incentivized based on if you hit your numbers by a certain date. Mm. You know, neglecting the fact that both those targets and those dates are arbitrary. You know, somebody picked a number, and usually it's one year because that's when we pay taxes. Like, mm. that's pretty much it. Um, and it was uh, this, I tripped over this idea, like I trip over all my ideas. Um, there's a um, James Carsey, who's a, who's a NYU theologian, uh, retired now. He wrote a, a little book in 1986 called Finite and Infinite Games. And it proposed that um, there are these two types of games, finite games and infinite games. A finite game is defined as known players, fixed rules, and agreed upon objectives. Baseball. And the, the, the purpose is to win, right? Then you have infinite games, um, which are defined as known and unknown players. The rules are changeable, and the objective is to perpetuate the game and to stay in it as long as possible. Um, and so we are all unwitting players in infinite games. Mm -hmm. So for example, there's, there's no such thing as being number one in marriage. There's no such thing as being the winner in friendship. You know, There's no such thing as winning national politics. There's no such thing as winning education or winning your career. And there's definitely no such thing as winning business. right? Um, I'm the winner of business. Like it doesn't exist because there's, there's no end, right? right? There is no finish line. But if we listen to the language of most leaders, they talk about being the best, being number one, and beating their competition. There's no agreed upon metrics and there's no agreed upon timeframes. So it's not true. And so what this, so I realized that if infinite games exist and we're unwitting players in infinite games, but we're leading as if we're finite players, as if, as if we're in finite games, then, then we needed a new, a new set of directions to, to guide us on how to lead in the infinite game, how to lead in the infinite game of business. And um, the book that I'm, the book, uh, Infinite Game, um, really challenges uh, many of the accepted notions of how business works today. You know, it really is an indictment of American and Western business, American in particular, of Western business philosophies, which were pretty much honed in the 80s and 90s. So if you consider that the concept of shareholder supremacy was um, a theory proposed in the late 1970s, popularized in the 80s and 90s, now it's standard fare. Yes. Right? When you hear CEOs talk about prioritizing the shareholder. That was just a theory in the late 1970s. And it was popularized during the boom years of the 80s and 90s of a time of regu uh, uh, um, relative peace. You know? And now it's no longer boom years, and these are no longer relative peace. These are different times, and yet the theories haven't adapted. The concept of using mass layoffs to balance the books. Think about that for a second. It, we are going to use um, the livelihoods of our people in order to meet arbitrary projections for an arbitrary date, as opposed to t we're still profitable. We just want to be more profitable. And, and, and in so doing, destroy our culture destroy trust and destroy cooperation. And then companies are flabbergasted why they can't hold on to employees, why uh, discretionary effort is declining, why, you know, they, and they blame millennials. Millennials, you know, aren't loyal. No, that's not true at all. Um, millennials are growing up in a world in which companies offer no loyalty, that it's not a meritocracy. It doesn't matter how hard you work. It doesn't matter how good you are. It doesn't matter how good a teammate you are, that if the company misses its arbitrary projections on the arbitrary date, you're out. I look back and I realize, oh my God, we got so much wrong in the 80s and 90s. Uh, Milton Friedman, Milton Friedman was a Nobel Prize winning uh, economist who uh, offered us what is considered the definition of the responsibility of business today, which is he proposed that the responsibility of business is to maximize profit within the bounds of the law. What about ethics, right? That's the equivalent of me being in a long-term relationship, right? And I cheat on my girlfriend and when she finds out and confronts me with it, I say to her, you can't be upset with me because I broke no laws. Uh -huh. Which would be true, by the way. Yeah. It's not like marriage where there's a contract. Mm -hmm. Like there's actually no law governing this relationship, right? So when companies do very unethical things that make us uncomfortable, we all know it's gross. 
and then we put them in front of Congress and they testify, all the CEOs say the same thing. We, were, we, were, we acted within the bounds of the law. That is a very low standard, mm -hmm. right? Um, but these are the standards. Um, and shareholder supremacy and the, 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 the shorter and shorter term uh, uh, um, goals we set and mass layoffs and rank and yank and all these stupid ideas that came from the 80s and 90s, which were fine for the 80s and 90s, are really doing more damage to American businesses um, than in the past. Um, and so this book really attempts to challenge the finite thinking that uh, governs most businesses and offer a new, a, new, a new perspective. What does working at a company where a leader has an understanding that they are in an infinite game, the whole organization understands that this is an infinite game, what does that look like? Um, if a company leads um, based on the infinite game, what you will find is that there's a sense of cause at the heart of the company. It's, 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 it's not about being the biggest or being the best because we accept there's that there's no, best, there's, there's, there's no base, such thing. Right. There's the sense of winning, like there's a sense of progress and moving forwards, advancement. I would, call it, I would call it adherence to the cause and advancement of the cause. There's a sense of advancing, but there's no sense like we're going to be the best mm -hmm. or we are the best because everything's temporary, right? You're the best for now yeah. based on the metrics you chose, based on the time frames you chose, you know? You could, you know, you can, you can write it any way you want. Um, and so in, in, an, in an infinitely led company, you'll, send, you'll find that there's a sense of cause so just that people are willing to sacrifice for it, meaning they would turn down, for example, a better paying job because they'd rather be here and be a part of this. It, it, it feeds my soul. It makes me feel like my life has value. My, my work has meaning. Right? So you'll find just causes at the center of it. You'll find um, a vastly greater concentration of trust that there are trusting teams, that people are willing to say, I made a mistake, or I need help, and expect that people will rush to them to help them solve the problem or give them the support they need, as opposed to finding, of being afraid yes. that if they say anything that they'll find themselves on a short list you know, at the end of the financial year. Um, um, and without trusting teams, you know, too many people are coming to work lying, hiding, and faking. We hide our mistakes. We never admit that we don't know what we're doing. We get promoted to a job where we feel out of control, but we're not going to ask for help or say, I need more training. And so when you lie, hide, and fake every day, when we lie, hide, and fake every day, eventually things break. So infinitely led companies have much, much higher uh, proportions of, of trust that just, you know, inside the company. And wouldn't we want to work there? They also made the very clever um, uh, shift away from seeing those in their industry as competitors and rather see them as rivals. Because a competitor is someone you want to beat, right? And the obsession is too much, again, on the finite, right? What are the metrics? How are we going to get ahead of them? A rival is someone whose strengths reveals to you your own weaknesses. So to, to see those in your industry and admire where they are better than you, uh -huh. instead of trying to beat them, you look at where your weaknesses are and improve. It's constant improvement, right? And that's a very sophisticated idea to to not see those in your industry as competitors to be beaten, but rather as rivals that reveal to us our weaknesses so that we can improve. That's a tough mindset change. It's a tough mindset. Change. All of this stuff is tough. Everything, everything about, uh, everything about uh, running an infinite organization and being an infinite leader is difficult because the finite is just so much easier. It's laid out. It's easily measurable. Uh, you can count it. You, it's, you know, it's, where the infinite is, is, is sometimes more ethereal. Now, there are always finite within the infinite. You know, there are were, there were wins within, but each win has context. Like, it goes back to the story of me turning down a client, which is, you know, I could win this piece of business and make the money, but the context of what I'm trying to achieve, this is the wrong client to help me do that. And so now, I only want to win the business within the context of the just cause of the infinite game. And so everything takes on new meaning. Um, and it is all unbelievably difficult, and it is um, much easier to focus on the finite, even though we'll do damage as we go. Uh, and um, it is much more fulfilling to be in the infinite game. Yeah. It's much more stressful to be in the finite game. Uh, there's much more fear in the finite game. Um, the infinite game is inspiring, but yeah, if it were easy, everyone would do it. It's, and our economy and most of our incentive uh, programs and rewards packages and companies are not geared around the infinite mm. game at all. And yeah. so there's, n there's no pressure to play the infinite game. Quite the opposite. All the pressure is to play the finite game. So it's incredibly difficult. But my god, when you get it right, innovation skyrockets. 
trust skyrockets. Uh, cooperation skyrockets. Uh, the ability to adapt to change in, in, in technology skyrockets. I mean, here's some examples of finite industries that are, that are embarrassing, right? So um, the publishing industry didn't invent Amazon. The movie industry didn't invent Netflix, right? Uh, uh, it's, it's the, car, the, car, the car companies didn't come up with Tesla. Like an upstart is, is taken on, the, on, on, on auto manufacturers. Like they're so preoccupied with the existing business models and protecting what they have. You know, like when Blockbuster was a thing, they, they saw Netflix coming. They saw the subscription model that Netflix was offering, which was different to their model. Even though streaming wasn't, at the, wasn't quality there yet, they, they knew it was coming. And the CEO, the then CEO of Blockbuster, recommended to the board that we really need to change our business model. And the board would not allow him to do so because the company made 12% of its revenues from late fees. And if you go to a subscription, you'll lose all that revenue. And now they're bankrupt. That's called finite thinking. Where they're so obsessed with protecting the status quo because they have, they have benefited from the status quo, that they, they, that they literally will not undergo the existential flex that they need to take to stay in business. And so now you have publishing that has their lunch being eaten by a company that they should have invented. You have the movie industry that's struggling to figure out how to keep, com, keep up with, uh, you know, why isn't it that the, 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 that the architecture firms and property companies didn't come up with WeWork? They were so busy making their own offices that they thought it was, you know, that, that they, that, and so all of these companies, all of these industries are being disrupted by people outside their industry. That's an indictment on the way in which they view their businesses. Infinite businesses are much more adaptable. Infinite companies can bend and weave much more easily with changes in technology and see the writing on the wall. And the ones that have done it in the past, we think that they can tell the future. You know, people, Steve Jobs could tell the future. No, he couldn't. Of course he couldn't tell the future. He had, an, he had a just cause. He was leading an infinite organization. He was an infinite leader. And he was able to see that investing in the graphic user interface was the right way to go, even though that's not the direction they were going in at the time. And that idea, that big flex, became the Macintosh. The entire platform of Windows is designed to act like a Macintosh. So that was a huge idea. Kodak couldn't make the existential flex. Kodak invented the digital camera in 1975 but couldn't bear the thought of changing their company away from film and chemicals and machines to embrace this digital technology. Of course, you know, digital became a thing somewhere else because once the genie's out of the bottle, you can't put it back. And Kodak made a ton of money from selling their patents, from the royalties they got from their patents on digital technology. And when those mm. patents ran out, about two or, three, two or three years later, they went bankrupt. That's called finite thinking. If I'm a leader at an organization which is finite, it's tough to just say, all right, I'm going to lead like an infinite leader now. I'm going to make my organization an infinite organization. Are there sort of practical steps that one can go through as opposed to just saying, like, think differently? Yeah, of course. That, of course. Yeah. Th this is where I'm, you know, James Carsey articulated this original concept of the finite and infinite. And what I hope to do is, is take his basic premise, which is a perspective of the world, and offer uh, steps in which we can actually take to lead within this infinite world. Um, so having a just cause, having trusting teams, um, having a, a worthy rival, the ability to make an existential flex, and, and then ultimately having the courage to lead are, are, the, are, the, are the essential five steps that, that have to be taken uh, in order to, to, to lead. And if you leave any of those out, you, you run the risk of sliding back into the, into the finite game. How has it been for you going through those steps? Um, you know, some of them have been a re reinforcement, like, oh good, we do this. And some of them have been like, Ooh, we need to do better. Um, uh, and you know, one of the things that's nice about the work that I do is that you know, our team, like when they get the ideas, they, they grab onto them and they look for all the ways in which we can not only embrace them and internalize them, but how we can better share them as well. So it's, you know, we are a company of constant improvement. Um, the, we, don't, we don't have any illusions that we're the best, but we're trying to be better every day. Um, and um, I'm very proud of the fact that we're on a journey of advancing our movement, advancing our cause, um, and, and that's, that's, that is about as good as anyone can do, which is 
completely fixated on the cause and, and looking for all the ways in which to improve internally and externally and how you do that. Um, so I, 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 you know, we're we're on an infinite journey, and it and the concept has given me the the, the not only the confidence but the guideposts um, to understand that it's not just crazy idealism. This is actually the way the world works. The world, like I said, we are unwitting players in the infinite game, and we don't get to choose. It's like you don't get to choose whether you, whether whether you obey gravity today or not. Like you have to work within its bounds, and the infinite game is the same way. It's 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 um, it's a force to be reckoned with. It's not, uh, it's not rules of a game. We don't get to change, you can change the rules of a game. You don't get to change the rules of the infinite game. Mm -hmm. it, like I said, it's more like a force that we have to, we have to um, cope with. And for those who accept the force, you can build airplanes. And for those who reject the force, you can flap your arms when you jump off a cliff and it'll feel amazing for a while and then you'll hit the ground. Well, I'll choose the former. Simon. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. It's a much. pleasure speaking with you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.